sure this works really quick. And then we'll uh, get started just in here in just a second. Uh, should we wait for anybody else who just wants to be done testing this? I think once you're done with that. Okay. Let go. Let me go ahead and post the meeting notes in the chat. Oh, Derek already did it. Beat me to it. <laughs> Thank you much. You're welcome. All right. We gotta make the housekeeper faster if we can. Probably can't. Can we? I don't know why. Okay. All right. Let's kill it. Wait. How did it ever rate it? That's fine. All right. Well, yeah. I did it too fast, didn't I? All right. We'll just get. Yeah. We'll just get going. All right, so I figured we'd go ahead and get started. So um, thank you guys for coming, we appreciate it. Uh, so we got a couple of pretty cool updates this week. Um, I think one of the biggest ones is the fact that uh, workers can now be set to automatically start when Augur starts up, and they will also be killed when Augur is killed as well, uh, meaning that for people who don't necessarily care so much about um, controlling the workers individually and just want to set Augur to start and stop and that's it, um, we can take care of that whole process for them. Uh, the only thing that has to be changed is in the config file. Um, let me pull it up. Um, Do you want to say something? Anything? Yeah, this is just meant to make the data collection part of Augur easier for users um, because going into the individual worker directories and setting them or like telling them to start after Augur is already running and just managing all the processes in your head. Like if you don't already know the project's architecture, it could get kind of confusing. So it's just kind of meant to make that process easier and just have it all in one place. So like Carter was saying, all you need to do now is in your config in these worker sections, you can just turn the key called switch to one to activate that worker. And automatically when August uh, starts. Automatically when August starts, and uh, and then next time you do Augur run, the workers will start up with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we're here, uh, we probably also should mention that we've also added the capability for there to be multiple instances of a worker now. Um, before I believe it was just one instance of each worker, but we've uh, Gabe's done some cool stuff, and now we can have more than one of of all of them, right? Uh, yeah, it works with all of them. And with certain workers, we are limited by API rate limits, uh, specific, yeah, specifically with the GitHub worker. Um, mm -hmm. But we are currently working on ways around that, so we're not bound by things like that. Um, and then you can have as many instances of a worker as you can handle to make uh, the collection of these data models two, three, four, or however many times faster. So that's great. And for our workers that don't have API keys, you can just go ahead and work with that functionality now and it speeds things up greatly. And so it's good for new deployments and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to get started as quick as possible? Um, so those are some two pretty big worker updates. Um, some other stuff that we've been working on. Um, oh, this is a good point, Gary. Um, so uh, before we had um, the, so the facade worker clones the repos that it does analysis on uh, to the machine that's running Augur. Um, it can't work without those, those git files directly on the file system. Uh, before it was configurable, but you had to go into the database and manually change it yourself. Um, now every time you run the config, it will ask you where you want to clone those. Um, so we don't have to assume um, a, like a place on a user's computer, um, we can just leave it up to them. Um, in the future, we will provide a default, like a reasonable default. It will probably be somewhere within Augur's directory. We don't want to pollute anybody's file system more than we absolutely have to. Um, but that makes it a lot easier. People know where the repos are being cloned, and if they ever need to go clean it out for whatever reason, or if they just want to go look at them, they're there, and they have control over that. Um, another big thing is that we, um, I know in a previous call we've mentioned that uh, Repos can automatically be inserted into the database um, through the use of a Augur DB command. Um, and we have created the equivalent um, of that command for repo groups. So now um, users don't have to manually create repo groups like in the database, like with the visualization tool or at the command line. Um, there's a, this command right here um, will take a path to a CSV file and then we'll create those repo groups automatically. Um, 
if it if it can allow them to be created. Um, and uh, there's some documentation that exists around it. It's not pushed yet, um, just because I'm still tweaking some stuff, making sure it all works correctly. Um, but that we hope will make it a lot easier for people to start creating their own repo groups. They don't have to rely on the default ones or ones that we have generated for them. Um, so we're hoping that'll help uh, help usage increase. You know, be a little bit uh, easier commands to work with. Um, and then another really big thing that we did this week. Uh, so Argo is now distributed with a sample data set. Uh, wait, before I go on, anybody have any questions? I don't go kind of fast. Or should I just keep going? No, it's not for questions. Yeah. <clears throat> Which there may not be any. Yeah, I, I'm following. Keep going. <laughs> okay, sweet. Right. Awesome. I just want to make sure. Sometimes I talk a little bit fast. Um, so Augur is now also distributed with a sample data set that will be um, that can be optionally loaded on install. So it will prompt the user for, hey, do you want to load a sample data set? Um, it's pretty small. It's what, 24 megabytes? Yeah, it's pretty small. It's, it's pretty five, small. It's five chaos repositories, including Augur and Grimoire Lab and a couple of working groups. Um, basically, so that you can, if you want to just run Augur out of the box and see what it does without having yeah. data, it's there for you. Linky light, effectively, huh? Yes. 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 Good. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so we hope this will also be um, an option that will let people get going even faster if they want to, you know, spin up as quick as possible and just start playing around with stuff and then maybe worry about collecting data later. Um, they can just do that and then, you know, if they like the visualizations, they like what they see, um, you know, we'll have some documentation about um, how exactly to do that. We're working on that documentation now. Uh, all of the worker stuff, it's, it's coming along pretty nicely, but it's, it's not quite ready yet. Again, with the uh, same with the other command documentation. Um, so that's pretty, I know we've been, a lot of people have been asking for that for a long time. And we do also plan to make this um, independently distributable of Augur. Um, so if you just wanted the data set that we've collected for these repositories, we'd be able to get that to you as well. Um, since it is so new, we haven't had time to develop that, but it might be available just as like some schema files or some SQL files that you can download from a separate repository or as a Docker container. We haven't really figured all of that out yet. Um, but we really hope this will help people get started, um, especially because it's a pretty comprehensive data set. Matt and Gio would seem to agree. Awesome. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. That's what we like to hear. Um, and then, as we've mentioned earlier, um, there can now be multiple instances of those workers, like Gabe was talking about. And then, um, looks like some new license data is being populated. I don't know a whole a lot about that. Sean and Matt, you guys have been working on that, right? So yeah, I can I can speak to that. Yeah, go for it. Basically, we went to we went to add a count of each license that's in the like how many files have this license or whatever. Well, there's and, a um, like the density of a license within a project. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to add a count as another um, column there, but I had to change the whole schema to do that. So we have to rescan everything basically the way it's going right now. So we're in the process is actually running right now, scanning all of the repositories and adding more SVOMs and things like that. Or we got to change the name from SVOM, but you know. Mm -hmm. That's also That's very cool. Yeah. And we're, if this works just fine and works how we want it to, then we're going to start working with other uh, instances, and we have to do some requests to figure out what, what times we work with people for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. Um, so I'm assuming that the uh, change to the schema has to do with that table that has a hundred or two columns. Is that? Being oh, um, anyway? it's it has to do with the SPDX schema on the main database. So okay. that's has all the information. And there's a uh, SBOM scans are on the um, the the main part of the database, the Augur data. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, Gail, okay, I see your question down here is an update on the installation process. Um, you'll be happy to hear that yes, we have made progress. Um, we were running into a very was it, I, was it a weird error? We just were we being not smart about how to do Postgres. Um, basically, uh, because of the way that I think the, the shell works and the PSQL command works, um, there was some weird stuff happening where uh, even if you had a valid, um, if you had valid access to a server, um, like through a normal terminal, whenever you execute it in a bash script, it wouldn't see that, basically. Um, but we figured out a good way to get around that by adding it. So there's a file in, um, the user's home directory called .pg pass, and it's the global Postgres, like that's where the credentials usually get stored across all Postgres applications and by Postgres itself. So um, when a set of credentials are added to that file, 
then um, anytime Postgres sees a connection coming from, or uh, somebody, somebody's trying to connect with those credentials to a server, if it knows about it, it'll allow it. So in the install script, we now, after prompting the user for their database credentials, will um, append that to the end of the pgpass file, and then the install will work as normal. Um, so we, there won't be any of the weird stuff about like asking for a password that you didn't that yeah. you didn't like that you didn't set, or it's like you no know, password provided. Um, but we tested that pretty thoroughly, and it's yeah, it's basically um, it lets you do a headless install. Yeah, yeah. Um, without having to like be prompted every time we run a database command. Uh huh. Um, I know that was the big issue that we were seeing last week. Were there other ones that you were um, thinking in particular, Georg? No, I, I just remember last week we went through and we were not able to finish front to end. So I just want to see if there was an update and uh, if we can finish front to end. I think there was a little bit of an anomaly in there that we had to sort of dance around. Yeah. Um, which, can, which is fixed. Yeah. Um, if awesome. we want, I can go through a sample installation. I'll just install a new on my computer. I was testing this like 20 minutes before. So if it doesn't work, then mm -hmm. the computing gods just have decided that I am not worthy. Um, so if that's if that's cool with you, Georg, if that would help, um, we can go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, I'm happy to if if we have time for it to go through and maybe provide additional feedback. Yeah, absolutely, we'd love that. All right, so I'm going to pull up the terminal. Oops, it's getting funny. All right, my computer's good. Um, yes, yeah, so before we do that, does anybody else have any other questions uh, based on this stuff? Can we just jump into the install and see how it goes? Is there a way in the repository we can put something up that says? Um, on the dev branch, or on, on our actual instance, uh, auger.oss health, it's not going to work for um, a lot of the risk metrics until we get this finished. So it'll take a few days. Okay. Um, yeah, we should note about uh, the risk metrics um, just being a work in progress. Basically, yeah, it has, it'll take somewhere from four to seven days. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, we can definitely do that. We don't want people to think it's broken. We just want to know, we want them to know we're making it better. Yeah. Good point, Matt. We should, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be able to get that sorted out. This should be no problem. Okay. So let's just go ahead and jump into another install. So uh, I'm just going to do it on my desktop. So I'll do a completely clean install. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is let me go to our repository. Plug it fresh. Hopefully the installs don't conflict, but I don't think they will. And then a fresh virtual environment. Yep, we'll make a fresh virtual environment as well. So get clone into our repository. Again, we are on university Wi-Fi, so sorry it takes a little bit. No worries. So I see you updated the readme in the repository to uh, no longer have install instructions, but direct to the documentation now. Come again, Garrick. You're saying direct this. You're saying uh, direct people to the documentation for install instructions? I, I'm saying I see the change you've made. So in the readme, there's no longer install instruction. It just says go over to the documentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I okay. Like that. It keeps everything in one place. Doesn't yep. Matter. That was ex that was exactly my thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just go ahead and follow these instructions. So I'll do it side by side. So oh wow, almost done already. Okay. So we've done our Git clone. Um, can everybody see this? I think this. Is yep. Good. This is a good way. It looks good on my screen. Okay. Perfect. Um, so now we do this. I'm going to cd into Augur. So now to make sure I'm on this. Um, this, just as a side note, I am going to do this from the dev branch. Um, just for the purposes of this install only, uh, we ran into today a, a weird little logic error that's preventing us from merging these changes into master um, for just a little bit. Once we get sorted out, this is all going to be in master, and we're going to sit down right after this call and make that all happen. So for the purposes of this install only, um, simply because of that weird Travis test error, um, we're doing it on dev. This will be, the, well, this will be in master very, very shortly, um, as in hopefully an hour after this call. Um, but so then we need to create our virtual environment. Um, 
I also did make that change, as you suggested, Georg, to Python 3. The more I thought about it, the more I was like, that's just going to make more sense. More often than not, it's probably going to be Python 3 on people's systems. Um, so I just went ahead and did that. Um, I know that was something that you had talked about before. Um, I think that makes it more consistent, easy for people. Yep, exactly. So now that I've created my uh, environment, I'm going to source oops, home. Um, I'll go to new env uh, slash bin slash activate. Uh, I'm using a fish shell, so my command's a little bit different, but it is a correct shell. As we can now see, um, I'm in my uh, virtual environment, and so now I'm going to do install. So it'll have to go through the whole install process of installing um, the, the back end dependencies for Augur itself, as well as for all of the workers, the front end, um, building the documentation as well. Um, so let's we'll have to sit here and, and watch it go. So this already looks a lot smoother than the last time I saw an install um, collection. Yeah. yeah. Looks a lot nicer. Yes, we've been working so, on what like to do. Yes. <laughs> but I've been working very hard to make it as easy as possible. We're getting there. It's a work in progress. It's an, we're iterating. So yeah, no, this was looking too good uh, to be really good. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not. It's looking really good. <laughs> I, I'll reserve the judgment until it's fully installed. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. We are seeing some warnings, but you know, for the most part, it's pretty. Cool. Yeah, I think a lot of those. It. I think most of them. It's. I think it's my because I'm using a outdated version of pip. It's like a version behind. And so every time it sees a pip command, it's like, you got to upgrade it. I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want it yet. There's, a, there's one error that comes up for the value worker because it doesn't exist yet mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the main branch. It exists in parts development branch. And we haven't moved it over yet. But mm -hmm. we, by default, build all the workers I've created directories for. And so I could take that directory out, but I haven't. <laughs> uh, we could also create a little bogus setup.py that was successful. We could. <laughs> yeah, so, that's the. And then npm is, npm generates errors. And yeah. We suppress, we could suppress yeah. them, but we'd rather you see them. I think even if you try it, it's still generated. Okay, so now we're at the, the contentious part. Um, so we're going to enter database credentials. I'm going to do it on my local machine um, just for ease of use. Um, so I'm going to make sure, so my Postgres is running in the background to make sure that it is actually going to work. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out. So I'm going to enter the command line, and I'm going to set up a local database. Uh, we will call it auger local. Mm -hmm. uh, the user will be auger. The port will be 5432, which is what it is on my machine. Uh, password, we will do a password, because we like secure passwords here. So I need a GitHub API key, and I'm going to put in a random key, because I don't want you guys to see my GitHub API key or have One it second. One second before you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so here, one, two, three. Um, the difference between one and two is that I can enter the IP address or location of the server in two, right? The difference between one and two is that two assumes that the database has already been created and there's not a schema. Um, so like you have an auger database, but there's the schema <coughs> hasn't actually been loaded. You just like have a database name that's whatever. Three, right? schema two. It, the come again, sorry. That's number three where it's already configured. Um so three is you have the schema on a on any database. Two is there's a remote database, a remote Postgres installation that has a database with no schema, and one is a local complete local setup, assuming that you don't have the database or the schema. Um, if you had a local one that you ha had a database, like a specific Augur database with no schema, then you could pick two. Um, if it's confusing, we also can edit the language a little bit. But the idea is local, you have nothing st installed already. Two is um, you have some local data, you have some remote database with no schema. And then um, Three is you already have the schema and you're just maybe setting this up again. Like you've already run Augur, maybe this is just on a different computer. Does that make sense? Maybe it makes sense to someone who works more with, data, with databases. Okay. Maybe. To me, it's, um, it, this is asking different things in the same question. For one, it's asking whether you want to enter the location of where your database server runs. And the second question is whether you want 
the schema to be deployed or whether it's already existing. So okay. Two questions bundled into one that I'm seeing here. True. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can make, yeah, the, we can change up the language more and maybe yeah, in parentheses put some discrete points of like, yeah, this option would be you have this, but yeah. not this, yeah, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely, Georg. That's a good point. We did try to edit it a little bit after you, the, you brought up the concern last week, but it seems like there's still some confusion. So we can, we'll, we'll iterate on that. And, and hopefully by next week, we'll have something that makes a little bit more sense. I think having some examples of like, if this description fits you, then pick this option um, would probably help. Would that, would that help you? I think it sounds more like uh, playing a game of 20 questions to figure out what they have and don't have. And what yeah. Um, doesn't. Yeah. So I can do that. Hopefully so, not actually yeah, 20 no. questions. <laughs> yeah, no, we could put them through a series of questions. Yeah. So like, do you want to look, do you want to, or do you already have a database? Yeah. Or not, do you want it local or remote? Yeah, things that like might that. even be easier. So that's not, there's only, yeah. Actually, that, that's probably better now that I think about it. Would you prefer that, Georg, to have like a first pick local or remote? Then do you have a database or not? Then do you have a schema or not? And then based on that, you'll ask me to a specific set of credentials. Yes, that makes more sense to separate those out. Okay. 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 Cool. Um, Sounds like a plan. Yeah. I have I can... Another feedback. Mm -hmm. So, um, in I'm looking at the installation document that you have on the right, mm -hmm. and from top to bottom, it just says you need Postgres installation. Um, I don't know whether it makes sense to add some information here about um, what is required, at what point you're configuring this. Um, so, so right now you just have Postgres at the top and then I know the make install asked and walks you through. Right. I just look at the documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be helpful to know that your make install, this process will and then ask for the Postgres <laughs> information just add a bullet point or something. Mm -hmm. So up here saying that the install will ask you for this Postgres installation. Oh, at um, the bottom. Or at the bottom. Where you okay. have that this process will, the make install process. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying about having one of these. I agree. Yeah, um, because without running the make install, if I just want to know, okay, what is required for me to install and I want to evaluate it up front, mm -hmm. there's more information for me here to understand the how it will be set up. Yeah, absolutely. Great point, Georg. Um, I think that'll help people be a little bit more confident and it, they know what to expect going into it. Um, yeah, we can totally add that. So then I'm gonna add my repo path, um, which I've already copied and I just know, that's actually, wait, I'm gonna, I can't see it. <laughs> um, so one thing about this is just because of the speed that I had to implement this, um, right now it needs, this needs to be an explicit path um, so like you can't put like dollar sign home into it. Um, and we assume the directory already exists. Um, and because just simply in the case of if you have a typo, we don't want to create a directory you didn't mean to create. Um, we can add a check in to say this directory doesn't exist. Do you want us to create it? Um, but that would be a little bit more um, logic, which isn't hard. Um, and I could easily do it, but just for now, it just needs to be an explicit path. And it also does, it needs to be absolute um, from the root directory and it has to already exist. Um, and all of those are, are detailed here. So it must exist, must be explicit and absolute. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put it in there. And so now it's going through and creating a massive number. This is uh, the schema creation, all of this crazy stuff that's up here. Um, so then when I like to load my database with some sample data provided by Augur, how long does the load take on average, Sean? Should I just do the it? Data load? Yeah. It's not two bits, probably about three to five minutes. If it's local, probably faster. All right, we'll give it a shot. Because <clears throat> I did a very, I did, I, this five repos is a relatively small data set. Mm -hmm. And I'm using the- Oh, that was it. <laughs> yeah, the, the psql copy command yeah. is, is pretty, pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that took what, like, 15 seconds, it finished before your sentence finished. Yeah, so, yeah, the, so my three minutes yesterday was loading it remotely. Yeah. Basically, network latency. Yeah, 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and install Argus front-end dependencies, and then we get to look at all the beautiful, amazing, wonderful, descriptive NPM errors that no doubt are going to come up because of NPM. If you can't tell, a little bit better. <laughs> I've got a question for mm -hmm. you. Um, so I see a lot of data like kind of flying by when that happens. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it I, honestly, I think it would be harder to get back to what I was looking at before or refer to something before if I, I don't see, I don't see much of a benefit that it provides to see all that data like flying by. Mm -hmm. So you would rather it just like not, we, not output and just like suppress the output and just say can, creating schema and then done. Uh, well, like maybe a progress bar or something. I don't know how okay. hard that is to be I honest. Want, I want progress bars. I have no idea how to do them, but I'll look into it. Okay. Meanwhile, if, if um, Always, I mean, I thought about rerouting all the output on the load to dev null, which would just make it not show up. But mm -hmm. um, on a remote, it was taking three minutes, and three minutes with no feedback was worse to me. Yeah, personally, yeah. than yeah. yeah, it's seeing some stuff less. Mm -hmm. I I agree, Matt. I think a progress bar would be would be pretty sick. It could have one of those cool animations as it goes up. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be nice. Even if it's not an animation, even if you yeah. say total number of uh, SQL statements that are being run, and this is how many are already complete, just a, you know, yeah. out of fifteen. Yeah. All right. So, building for production. My computer is on fire right now. That's okay. It should be. Almost there. Should be. So hopefully, um, this install process has been. Uh, it's hopefully you guys think it's a lot easier. I know there's a couple little things in there that we talked about, um, but we've been working really hard to fix all of those weird errors from last time, um, and to just make it as, as simple as possible. And I think Aaron, your point about um, having like just asking a series of like the twenty questions thing. Um, I think that's really going to take it to another level as far as like, like worrying that you pick the wrong option. You won't really have to worry about that. Um, so build filled with errors. Yeah. Yeah. It filled with errors because it always goes with errors. Um, I don't think these actually mean anything, do they? No. They're, they're yeah. Not. Yeah. We're, we're not sure. It just, those happens. And if you'll notice, these are all in a library. Um, they're not our code. Like there's something wrong in the Vega Lite library. We don't know how to fix that. Um, we're working on suppressing these errors so it doesn't look like something's wrong with the Augie. Yeah. There isn't. Yeah. Um, so now, if I do Augie run, it's going to sit there and think for a second. So look, there we go. Um, and if I go to here, it's not going to show me anything, but if I do slash API slash unstable, um, so these are all the workers, I think, that are going crazy. Um, it sees that there are a bunch of projects that are now in the repository. Um, we should, are these supposed to pipe to figure out? It just goes through every API um, call of the best practices badge. Oh, OK. It's populated the database. Gotcha. Um, it goes up to about 3,400, if, if I remember right. OK. Um, is there a way to put this like in a separate log file? Yes, you can pipe it. Okay. Um, it, it just has a JSON, or it has a, it's a Python output for that. So okay. there's ways to do that. Yeah, okay. I was seeing this yesterday and I didn't, had no idea what it was. Um, I assume that's the repo info worker? Oh, uh, that's the badge worker. I oh, know the badge worker, you're right. Um, but the server is actually up and running. Um, and then obviously there's all this stuff going on in the background. If we kill it, um, you'll see it kills all the worker processes as well. Um, and everything else got killed as well. And we check to see if it actually killed. Do you think it's been long enough? I should give it a second. Yeah. All right, we'll give that a minute. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit for the workers to actually start, uh, shut down. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll do, oh, wait, no, if we do make that, it'll start up again. Yes. All right, so let's do. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, yeah, you're right. Let's do that. Um, so really quickly, I'm going to, oh, all the sw these switches are both. Set the right instance of all uh, No, it's not. <laughs> Excellent point, Gabe. 
Um, so I'm just really quickly going to set the these to all uh, not start up, and then we'll just verify that the front end does start correctly. Uh, I love Sublime Multi Edit. So do make dev. There we go. So it's booting the back end and booting the front end as well. So that's starting development server. Does that mean it's does that mean it's up or do I need to wait for the oh uh, wait? There we go. All right. So we can see that the back end has started up with these here. Um, and then now we're working on the front end. So when it comes to having those switches on, mm -hmm. it'd be kind of drawing if I started it for the first time and I and I all of a sudden all my work is fired up because my computer does not have a lot of RAM for my Ubuntu subsystem. So mm -hmm. like it, it, I think it'd be good to have something I can do and make that would help me switch those switches without going into the actual config file. Maybe some flags or something, or maybe questions during install with what yeah, you want. Yeah, I was thinking call. questions during install, but I don't want to make it too heavy. So uh, maybe it's another make command or something, I don't know. I'm trying to think about the best way to do that. Um, I think we could maybe should prompt during install so yeah. like they don't so they don't like surprise the user and like, yeah. oh, like what's going on. Um so prompt for which workers to auto start. All right. And did you say flags uh when running make dev or auger run would also be helpful? Has yeah, like flags to, I mean, that'd be something if you wanted to run certain workers specifically, if there's no flag for them set. Yeah, yeah. Matt, this looks like a risk card. Oh, yeah. I actually uh, don't use the risk card anymore. Um, okay. So you can get rid of that if you want. All right. You can get rid of that. I'll do it right now, just for this one. Uh, front end. Where is it? Uh, slash source slash components. And then I think it's, yeah. All right. So, oh wait, no, I can just do make that. Good to know, we can get rid of that. Okay, starts up again. Now I gotta wait for view CLI to build again. It might go looking for the risk card, but I doubt it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's true, it might. Yeah. Well, if we don't use it anymore, I suppose we'll find out soon enough. Well, one thing, one thing is for certain, the install is a lot better. It's really good now. We're well, glad to hear that. Okay. Yeah, it's looking for it. Yeah, it's looking for it, isn't it? All right. Should I go try to edit this on the fly or just not worry about it? I got the idea. Yeah. Um, We'll figure out what's happening with the risk card stuff, and then we'll make sure that that gets fixed. Um, oh yeah, you're right. Touch. You know what? Live demoing, you always find bugs. That's, you know, we're learning stuff every day. Components, risk card. That is the right directory, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. So besides the install stuff, um, are there any other general like questions that we can help answer? Um, I know there's probably some documentation that people are wanting that we're that we're working on specifically the the worker documentation and then some of that the more detailed stuff in the install. Um, any other questions we can help answer for you guys? Just like curious about what we're doing next. Um, we'd be happy to answer anything you have or just talk about stuff. This has been a really helpful session. Good. Great to hear. Yeah. Oh. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Agree. Thanks, Steve. I'm very happy it's being videotaped, too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have enough cycles I can actually follow along. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's the goal. Thank all right. You. So we click in here. We've got Augur. Got all of our sample stuff. Is it loading? Uh, yes, there it is. Also, it doesn't look like this. I just have an extension that makes it look like this. 
I'm gonna go. I think I'm gonna go with it. That's a close thing. It's pretty nice. Makes GitHub a lot easier to look at. Um, so yeah, we've got all of our sample stuff in here. We see Mr. Gabriel has been very busy um, with all of his commits. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we've got all of our, our metrics in there and this is just, this is just the sample data that's been populated already. Um, so that looks a little funny. Okay, I'm waiting for license coverage to load. Yep. I don't think I have license coverage on, I don't have license coverage in the sample data set yet because Matt and I were working through, <laughs> Matt, Matt and I, Matt's working through the, the license counting <coughs> piece right now. So I'm waiting for that to finish for, for, and then Matt and I are going to walk through getting that data in the sample data as well. Okay, so, great. So, and Matt was going to meet yesterday at four, but I didn't have the time. So hopefully we can find a time here real soon. Yes. So, hmm. Yep, life is like that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, we've got all of our data in here. And then if I click on those of you, is there another page I should go to? The risk page. Risk page. Oh, well, yeah, the risk metrics. Work. Yeah, we're working on those. Um, um, let's try the insights. This page work? Mm -hmm. Hey, it does work. Look at that. Um, does, this, does this one work as well? Yes. All right. I've got to make sure I, I don't click on anything. It's not going to work. This is where, uh, oh, this is where we just work. OK. Um, but you know, if we go back to these, let's maybe go to the evolution. We've got all of our sample data in here as well. Um, so it worked. I'm pretty happy it worked and that it was much easier. It seems like you guys also are happy that it worked and it's easier than it has been. Um, so and are there any other questions that we can help answer? Um, stuff you guys want to chat about? Um, no, I think that Good. I'm just curious if Matt's had any chance to do a run with the licensing stuff in Zephyr at all, or it sounds like licensing stuff still. Uh, it should be in the Zephyr instance. Let me check real quick. Okay. <clears throat> there was a, yeah. Should I check live, Matt, or do you want me to wait? I think there was, the, <coughs> for some reason, the, the, the badging coverage isn't showing up in that database, Matt. And the Zephyr one? Yeah. Yeah, we, we're gold. <laughs> yeah. We're proud of it. Yes. <laughs> everybody show. Show. I don't think, what are we at, Sam? We're like bronze? No. No, we're at 83%. 83%. Is bad. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what the badge says. Yes. 100% is badge. And okay. I think I silver, I, is silver next, Kate? Yeah, silver is 200% and gold is 300%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, about in the calendar here. All right. Mm -hmm. While we're working on that um, that new data for um, for all the repositories in the whole Augur OSS Health, uh, you might want to go to the main instance when we, once we finish that because it'll have the most updated version until we start working on like Zephyr and Science and other instances um, mm -hmm. with the new with the new licensing data. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'm about to go on trips for the next couple of weeks, so <laughs> maybe when I'm on, maybe when I'm back, I'll actually have some cycles again. That'll work. Um, hoping to see if we can get some of the licensing stuff uh, sanitized so that we can start to show it out um, for compliance summit. Mm -hmm. I suspect that. Oh, well, I think it'll be ready by December. Excellent. <laughs> is that when yeah. the compliance summit is? What? Mid December. December. Okay. All right. Yeah, but uh, like I say, it'd be good if we could do a really good pass of uh, sanity checking the data and the mappings and everything else, and that's going to require time to do right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, make sure I write that down. Okay. Good so, time. if you could aim for, if you could aim for having something ready to start, you know, deep diving in on the data and you know, correlating it, mm -hmm. um, I should be back. Sort of like I guess the third week of November is a good week, just before Thanksgiving week. Week before Thanksgiving, I'll be around. Okay. And I'll be around yeah. over that that holiday weekend too. So, that holiday week, if you want to catch up, we can do something then too. Yep, I'm sure Matt and Sean and, and us, the rest of us will we'll okay. be all over that. We'll make sure it's ready for you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, I think that's most of what we had. Um, just going through the new the new install stuff and talking about some of the, the changes that we've made. Um, 
Is there anything else? Can you think of anything else, Sean, that we want to hit on? No, I think those are the, the big things. Yeah. Uh, Kate, were you at the community call yesterday? No, I had okay. a stomp. So one of the things related to what we were just talking about is that for the Sapphire project, we would like to um, pilot chaos metrics, including the risk metrics. That's why I thought of it. Yeah. And produce a little report and then get community feedback on what the, the metrics mean and so on and so forth. Perfect. Um, I'm going to be meeting. Do you, if you've got anything that's um, prototype slash template, we're all going to be meeting in person next week in Lyon. And so the okay. whole TSC is going to be there and meeting on Thursday and Friday. And I'll be meeting with the board on Wednesday. So if you have anything before Wednesday, I'm happy to try to stick it in front of, you know, start getting feedback and say, this is something that's going on. Yeah. Oh, the TSC is best though, first. What we have right now is, um, you might have seen it in the weekly newsletter, a document in which we started at least conceptually thinking about what we will be doing, but we haven't okay. actually collected any metrics yet. So okay. Well, as soon as you're ready, we can also look at seeing if we can get you to present to the Zephyr TSC. It meets every week. Okay. And maybe yeah. uh, get them to, you know, see what you're thinking about catching and give you feedback as to if it makes sense or not. And I'll warn you, they are, uh, um, they're, how shall I put it? <laughs> I think you can get, I mean, <laughs> they have very strong opinions. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, here yeah. is the document for, in which we are thinking about which metrics to collect. Okay. Yeah. And this is the document we'll be iterating on. Perfect. More. Okay. Well, if you want me to basically make it visible to the, um, Chaos TSC, they'll be having, like I said, they're having sessions in face-to-face -face, and so that they can comment on it and see, ask for things that they actually care about. Would that be useful? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean. Sure. Then I'll, I'll basically share uh, this link then with the, um, um, the Zephyr TSC chair and ask her to add it to the agenda for the TSC to talk about next Thursday, Friday. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Happy to. Thanks for starting this off. I'm looking forward to seeing some this, yeah. these projects being used. This is really Matt's doing. Yeah, this is uh, Matt. Matt, <laughs> we're doing this. And um, what's the other one, Matt Snell? Jenkins X. Jenkins, Jenkins, yeah. Jenkins X and Zephyr are the two deep dives yeah. that, that we're doing with yeah. Yeah, and the tools that we have. <laughs> That's sweet. Okay. Just. I'll put a note down here um, uh -huh. that you are sharing it just so we have a track record of it. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. Um, okay. Maybe it was being funny because it was a direct link. Uh, there right. we go. That's my week. Uh, there we go. We got the public do we've got that public domain problem, but I do see the hot links now working. And I do see Apache. Why is it sort of, oh, Matt, is it sorted by um, occurrences yet on the licenses or not? Oh, uh, no, it's not. Uh, that's that's our change to scheme we're making, and that's um, going to come to the next projects after we finish the main directory. Sweet. Okay, I will. And we're actually not linking out to TODR legal anymore. Okay. We're going because we have more coverage of all the licenses. We're going to be linked out to um, the kind of like the see this category yeah. that SPDX has on their uh, API calls. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it looks like you might be running a scan code. We're looking at things. Are you using are you using scan? Uh, we're code using or? Nomos. Nomos. Okay. Yeah. You're then you're using. There's probably a way of getting it to use the right SPDX identifiers. And you might want to try to do that because then you can match up, up to that better. Uh, you, then yeah, you can match, that makes sense. You can match to the um, upstream SPDX repos much easier to put the links. Yeah. Without a yeah. translation layer. 
Yeah. Yeah, because CURL isn't really a license. Nor is yeah, I license. think a lot of these are actually added by um, whoever did the last version of this program, um, DUSOX. Yeah, I think so. so I, I have to remove those mostly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. Because <laughs> we have all the SPDX um, kind of like names for licenses, short names yeah. and data and stuff. And then we have a bunch of ones that I don't know where they came from. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it came from old Nomos before they actually started to pull in the SPDX stuff. Okay. Just working with SPDX, and so yeah, I think it's there's probably probably uh, maybe have this discussion with some of the pathology folk about how they handled that because they've gone through this as well because they use Nomos plugin and so they probably have something that does a translation slash you know change. Cool. Thanks for that. I'm just looking at it right now. Oh. Now, as soon as you, if you want to set up a meeting, uh, over let's see overview look for a second. I'll just check that. Uh, nice. Does anybody have anything else for us? That's it for me. No, that was really good updates. Thank you, right everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll work on making this document changes, documentation changes, and the the stuff that we talked about, Georg, and uh, we'll get this all into master as soon as we possibly can, so that there's, um, you know, get it distributed as much as we can. But um, yeah, if there's anything else, I think we can we can end a couple minutes early and let you guys have some of your Wednesday back. Uh, appreciate you guys coming and talking to us on the call, and your feedback is always very welcome. Yes, thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good one. Thank you, guys. Bye. See you guys.